and, and, and just less interested in doing things, which yeah. is um, weird for him. So. So we're recording now, um, so we will officially begin. <laughs> um, so hello, museum families, and welcome to Royal uh, RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded, and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum uh, YouTube page. I was actually counting them up uh, the other day, and I think we have about 25 of the RBCM at Home sessions, so episodes. We have about 18, 17 or 18 of the RBC at Home Kids and around 10 of the outside. Um, so I might be off on those numbers, but we have a lot of uh, sessions that we've created uh, during this uh, period. So definitely check out some of our, of our past sessions on our YouTube page. So my name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I am an uninvited guest on, the ter on this territory and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. So there's lots of talk about schools these days. We hope that things are safe. Uh, both Genevieve and I um, uh, both have kids. Um, so we feel this also, but we hope things are safe in, in the fall and where kids can go back to their physical school at least part of the time. We love schools, we love educators, and we love learning. Now, if you think about your own school, there's probably many classrooms, maybe there's an art room, most likely a gymnasium, many different grades, many, many kids. But imagine if your whole school um, was just one classroom and all the kids in your class were all the kids in the school. That would feel very different, but a long time ago, that was what was usual, um, especially in particular parts of British Columbia. So that's what we're gonna explore today. Um, but first, let's go back to last week, where we had, um, we were, our special guest was Ellen Rooney, uh, and we learned how to, to make pictures within picture books. So I'm gonna share the screen. Um, so, our RBCM at Home Kids program. So, Ellen um, was showing us how she makes her illustrations, which is really fascinating. And she did a lot of, uh, she does a lot of work with collage. And we looked at one set, she didn't show this picture from this picture book, just the words, good morning, Petunia, chattered the chipmunk sitting up straight on a maple stump. Where are you going? So, from that, we all sort of thought about what it would look like. And one of the participants created um, and shared with, with me what they created, um, which is really interesting to look at the actual illustration and what they came up with. Um, so fascinating world of thinking about how we create pictures to, uh, to add to the words on the page of a picture book. So we'll be creating a little bit today as well. Feel free to share that uh, with me. My email is cocconnor at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. You could share it through our social channels, so at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. And continue to explore after all the time at all hours of the day, if you'd like, um, at our learning portal. Um, and that's, uh, you could Google Learning Portal and Royal BC Museum. Lots of really, really interesting things there to learn about. Um, and also just to let you know, we're doing summer camps this summer, um, but online digital summer camps, we're calling Campish. Um, and there's three themes, Into the Wild, Drawing from Nature, and Design, Refine and Define, around 3D printing. So that's in August. So, and then next week for RBCM at Home Kids, uh, we're going to be uh, with Parks Canada and looking at food chain uh, and specifically around orchids and doing a fun activity around food chain. So, that's next week. Um, so, I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen now. And so, in this uh, format, you can see your host, that's me, and our special guests. And today, we have back Genevieve. Um, though we can't see you, we can hear from you if you use the Q&A box. 
uh, or the comments section if you're watching on Facebook Live. So please ask questions as we go along. And heads up, we'll doing, we're going to be doing some making today, so you'll just need paper and something to write with. Remember, we record these sessions, so you can, if you don't have materials right now, not a problem. You can watch this uh, now and then watch it again later when you do have the materials. Uh, make sure you do things at your own pace and take care of yourself, especially during this period. So let's meet our special guests today. Genevieve Weber uh, is an archivist at the BC Archives and a colleague of ours here in learning. And you re might remember Genevieve from a few weeks back when she was here with her son during the zine making workshop. So it's great to have you back, Genevieve. Um, so welcome back. Thank you. And um, so today we're going to explore one room schoolhouse. So what, what made you, what inspired you to think about that as a, as a topic to explore? Well, I, um, I'm an archivist at the BC Archives. So archivists work with uh, records that uh, are created by all different kinds of places, but some of the records that we have are, are created through government means. And, um, and there's lots of interesting photographs and other things, but one of my favorite right. collections- so when, you said, when you said records, what do you mean by records? The so records are kind of anything that records information. So it's uh, it can be a photograph as a way of capturing some what something looks like. Um, a document or a journal or a diary could be a way of recording what you're doing or what's happening in the world. Or a letter is a way of recording what's happening around in the world. Um, anything that you listen to, so a sound recording or a radio show or a video is another way of recording things. So anything that, that captures information, whether it's something you look at or listen to or read is considered a record. Um, and we have a really great collection of records in the archives that are government, they're made by uh, the government um, that are all about schools. So they're from a hundred years ago mm -hmm. and it's all about uh, the different little one room schoolhouses in the province. And I found it really interesting because when I was a kid, I, I grew up uh, in Langford, just outside of Victoria. And my school used to get to go on field trips to Craig Flower Schoolhouse when I was a kid. So if you've ever been to Victoria, you might have seen Craig Flower Schoolhouse. It's, um, it's a really little old white uh, building that is right on the water on, um, on the gorge. Uh, and it's... Um, it's really old and it's not open, I don't think right now, but when I was a kid, they used to have it open and you could, school classes could go in and spend a whole day there. And we would get dressed up in what we called olden days clothes. So we would wear something that we thought looked like it was over a hundred years old. And kind of uh, we would wear bonnets <laughs> <laughs> and we would go down and um, we would spend the whole day in the class learning about what it would be like to go to school back in the old days. And I remember one of my favorite memories is that at recess, there was no playground, but we were all given marbles to play with. And we were taught how to play games with marbles. So and that inside, was really- cool. Inside the, the schoolhouse. No, we would go sit outside in the grounds, but um, we weren't allowed to go. There was actually a public playground not far away from the schoolhouse, uh -huh. but because that wasn't part of the, uh, the 1880s or 1850s right. field, <laughs> we would have to stay in a little enclosed playground and we would play marbles on sort of like a dirt patch, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it was fun. And uh, they did have a bathroom inside the building by that point, but we were supposed to, you know, imagine what it would have been like to go to the outhouse. Cause of course in these little schoolhouses, they didn't have indoor bathrooms or running water a lot of the time. Right. So um, I always was really curious. Uh, which, is fine, which is fine in Victoria, but if you're in another part of British Columbia in the winter, that might be inconvenient. It might not be very comfortable, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was really curious about schools from when I was really little, I think because of going to Craig Flower Schoolhouse and seeing other schoolhouses around the province. And when I would go on holiday with my parents, sometimes you would see little schoolhouses. There was one out in Machosan, not far from where I lived that um, has been turned into a little museum. So I was really interested in that. And the documents that we have in the archives are really interesting because they sometimes have pictures of the schoolhouses, but they also tell you about what life was like in that village or that town. 
So they'll tell you what kind of jobs the grown-ups did. They'll tell you um, what sort of things there was to do for fun, uh, what kind of weather, and also how many kids were in the school. So sometimes, well, maybe we'll look at some of them and then we can see what the numbers look like. So what I thought we would do today is we're going to imagine or make believe our own schoolhouse. Oh, like the one that Chris is yeah. going to I was just going to say that this, this is the sign for today. But I love it. One Did Issa draw that? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Perfect. So we're going to see what some of them look like, and then we're going to make believe our very own uh, schoolhouse from 100 years ago and imagine what it might have been like. So you can either imagine your own town, maybe you live in a small town in BC and you're imagining what it would have been like 100 years ago, or you can make one up and you can make one up however you imagine it. So maybe you homeschool right now and there would have been kids that homeschooled uh, back then as well because they might not have had access to a school or their parents chose to homeschool them. So you can imagine a homeschool situation from 100 years ago or you can picture what a one-room schoolhouse would have looked like in your town or, or your made-up community. You can make one up entirely from your own imagination which I think is what I'll do today. So I'm going to start by showing you um, some of the documents online and uh, for anyone who's interested and uh, if you have a grown up with you and you want to explore this a little bit more afterwards, hang on one second, I'm having trouble finding it. There we go. Um, oops. You can also go and spend some time on the BC Archives website and you can look for your own hometown. You can look for your own community and see what kind of records there are. Um, so they're called Teachers Bureau Records. Um, any grown-ups out there, just remember this number. That's the number you're gonna look for, GR0461. That's the number that you can look for when you go to our website. And once you get there, you can see that there's over 1,300 documents as part of this collection. These records were made by teachers in 1924 and 1928. So the government decided to collect information about what they called rural schools. So rural means not in a big city. And they started collecting information about all of these rural schools. So this is almost 100 years ago. So it's really, I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking 100 years ago. Um, and what was life like then? And if you come from a small town, you can do a little search. So, so I'm going to... So especially for... for kids a hundred years ago so it's it would be 1920 and maybe like for me that would be my when my great great grandparents were little yeah yeah, yeah that's right it's a long so time for, ago so for kids it would be great 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 grandparents yeah yeah my great grandmother would have gone to school in the 20s so for my kids, it would be their great, great grandmother. Right. Just okay. going to school at this point. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna look up a little town called Windermere, which is in, for some reason, oh, there we go. Which is in um, the Kootenai region of BC. So you can see if you do a search, it'll come up with a, a few different places from that area. So I just wanted to show you how to do the search. You know what? I was probably searching incorrectly before when I did Cloverdale. Oops. Yeah, I don't know why it's not showing up. Somebody online was from Surrey, so I, I don't know why Clo Cloverdale isn't showing up. Maybe it was called by something else at that point. But you can do a search. You can find um, lots of different places by doing a search that way, and then you can click on them to see them. But I'm not going to click on those right now. I'm going to show you some of the ones that I've already brought up. So I'm going to save that one. So this one Atlin. Chris, do you know where Atlin is? Have you heard of that? Uh, sounds familiar. It's way, way up north near, um, near uh, Alaska. Oh. So it's quite far. Um, and this is the type of information that they have. So they have the name of the, of the school is Atlin. It talks about boarding and lodging facilities for teachers. So that means how did the teacher live? Did the teacher live with a family? Did they have, it, sometimes the schools would provide a house. Um, but this is one thing I really wanted to show is 
general living conditions of districts. So this person, this is written by a teacher. They said it's pretty good, but there is no conveniences such as electricity, sinks, furnaces. So um, this is something that I find interesting to think about is that people would go, they might have grown up in Victoria or Vancouver and got their teaching degree, and then they would go to these communities and there wouldn't be any electricity. They wouldn't have indoor sinks. So I like to think about how they had to manage with that. In addition to, um, to teaching, they also had to manage getting water for, uh, for their kids and, and, and light and how would they have light without, um, without using electricity. And, and also above, I, I noticed that it said how many kids in the area yeah. that go to school. So eight. Yes. Only eight. Only eight in the whole town. Can you but imagine? But all eight are actually going to the school. So. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my kids go to what is considered a relatively small school in Victoria. It's the smallest uh, elementary school in, in the Victoria School District. And there's three classes of each grade. <laughs> That's just of each grade. And this, the entire school, more than there eight. was only eight. Yes, a lot more. So, and then what I find really interesting too is there's often the section at the bottom with comments that we'll talk a little bit about what the community was like. So this one, it says, Atlin is beautifully situated, three fairly good general stores, a dance hall, moving pictures now and then. So moving <laughs> pictures is a funny old fashioned way to talk about movies. So they would have movies come in, but not all the time. And they probably showed them in the dance hall because they didn't have a movie theater. They certainly didn't have TV. Three hotels, two closing in winter, winter sports, boating in summer, many nice trips out of Atlin. So um, sounds like a pretty nice place to live, except for the fact that there's no electricity or sinks, <laughs> but otherwise not too bad. Um, that's one example. Now, a lot of them come with photos. So when we do our own imagining of some of these today, I'm, we're going to draw a photo of the school. There's some other photos that are a little bit more clear, but you can see that this one, um, it's one room. There's, it looks like there's somebody standing on the doorstep there. There was probably at the end here, what they call a mud room, which would have been a room where people would have come in and taken off their, mu their mucky boots and their, um, their coats and whatnot before they go into the main schoolhouse. It looks like there's two people there, right? Yeah, I think there is. It might be a, it might be two students. It's hard to tell. Right. Um, and over there, you can see the outhouse. So a little bit of a walk away to get to the outhouse. <laughs> um, this is Barnston School. Uh, and this one, I chose this one because I thought it was interesting it says, does the school board engage a janitor for the school? So um, most uh, schools nowadays have people that come in and clean the school, usually after the kids go home for the day. And a lot of these ones did not have janitors. And guess what? The kids had to do all of the cleaning. So they had to scrub the floors, scrub the windows, clean the chalkboards. Chalkboards, of course, were what people used before there was whiteboards in schools. Um, so the school, the kids had to go to school all day, but then they also had to do cleaning. So it was maybe not as much fun as school is today. Uh, oh, sorry, sometimes I have a hard time switching because of the little thing that comes down for my screen sharing. Here's another one with a picture. And I thought this one looked really interesting. It looks even smaller than the other ones. And it looks like it's a log cabin. So what would that other building be then? It's hard to say. It might be, um, it might be a shed. It might be, uh, it could be a living space, but I don't think this one is. This one, the person that says that they live with a private family. Uh -huh. It could be somewhere where the teacher uh, is able to put a horse if they come in on their horse in the morning, because some of the, this one they do, they're one and a half miles from the school where they live. So they might have to, um, they might, walk it but they might not so it's um it could be used for lots of different things and this one um i think i chose this one mostly for the photo um but they talk about the different uh people that are living in the area and this one i thought was interesting because it talks about how 
Um, this one, this place would be well suited to anyone uh, who likes an outdoor life. The summer here is ideal. Riding is the main pastime. So lots of horseback riding. Mm -hmm. So if you like horseback riding, this place would be a good place to go. And again, there's a little one room. It doesn't even have a mud room or anything, just one square room. And it looks like it might have like a little loft area too. Possibly, yeah. That one's got a really sloped roof. So that might be, that's near Williams Lake. It does snow a lot up there. So they might've purposely made that roof really sloped to keep the snow off. Would they ever have the, cause I'm thinking of St. Anne's Schoolhouse and mm. there was a, some of the teachers lived above in that little loft area. So, yes. So maybe they're sometimes it's built to have some living quarters above. It is, there are definitely some that have living quarters connected to them. So I think I've got an example of that one. This one, the person lives with the secretary Stanley mm. um, of the school board, but I think there's one, I might not have actually saved it. I found one where um, they don't have a school yet. So they were teaching school out of a little cottage that the teacher lived in. So it wasn't even a proper schoolhouse. It was just somebody's home and that's where the teacher lived. And then one of the rooms, it was a three room cottage and one of the rooms, they just turned one of the rooms into a classroom. Mm. So that's something else that would happen is it could just be that it's a house. Um, this one, it says that the, uh, the settlement is chiefly made up of German speaking people and there are three English speaking families. So this is something else that's interesting about these communities in BC is that as settlers came into the area, there would often be um, uh, groups of people that would come from the same country that would go live in the same place. So uh, the schools were all being taught in English, but sometimes the children all spoke other languages. So that was uh, something that is interesting to think about as well as where did the people who live there come from? Where did they move here from? Because mm. uh, these schools, you might notice, there are some examples of these little schools that had Indigenous students. But by the 1920s, Indigenous students were being made to go to residential schools mm. um, or day schools that were in there on the reserves. So the uh, schools that we're looking at today were mainly uh, made up of settler children. So children of families that came from other countries in the world, mostly from Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show a couple more examples and then we can start making our own. And this one, so this is a place called Bellevue. And I thought this was interesting because it says the general living conditions of the district, it says no social life, only four families one English, one American, one French, and one Italian. So four different families. There's 10 children, but eight enrolled in the school. And then down here, this teacher wrote, it is extremely isolated as you cannot go anywhere without, um, I'm not sure what that it, word is, but you have to go to this other town in a rowboat. But it does say it's pleasant in the summer. <laughs> um, but having to get and it seems, like, you it need seems to like this teacher maybe is a little bitter about being there. I'm not sure if this was their first choice yeah. <laughs> place to go. But um, but that is hard to imagine. Can you imagine if you wanted to get some groceries and the only way that you could get them was to take a rowboat to the nearest town? That's um, that's pretty isolated. And uh, Genevieve, if you go down a little bit, mm -hmm. it says um, the condition the condition of school building and grounds, the schoolhouse is very cold and uncleared yeah. grounds. So yeah. yeah, it gives a sense of like how difficult it is. Um, yeah. yeah. And you'll also notice in these pictures, something that's missing outside of the, of the um, schools are playgrounds. Mm. So I remember when I went to Craig Flower School as a kid that they said at lunchtime, we're gonna go on the playground and what they meant was a little patch of grass and dirt outside the school. There was no structures the way we're used to playgrounds having climbing structures and swings and slides. Those didn't exist then. A playground was, was 
just a space. And a lot of these schools didn't even have that. So they, when it says uncleared ground, that means that it was probably tucked in a forested area. There was no space for kids to run around. There was no fields for them to play sports. So um, when kids were going to school, they were really spending a lot of time in the school room or uh, maybe they'd go for a walk, but there wasn't a lot of play time, which mm. makes me feel a bit sad. Yeah. Um, and this one I chose because it says there is no water supply at the school. If water is needed, it must be carried from the nearest neighbor's house. So imagine if something happened, um, and this one also no janitor, so presumably the kids had to do the work. So they would have to walk over to the neighbor's house with a bucket, get some water from their well, and then hike back. They'd have to do that if they wanted drinking water, if there was anything that they needed water for. So that's, uh, that's pretty tough. And then again, this one I chose because it said this, this district is well suited for anyone who likes horseback riding. Um, but it does say as it is the only means of traveling about <laughs> short distances. But um, there was a lot of that was a lot of uh, one of the things that people did for fun. Oh, and there's a photo of this one as well. With with a horse. With a horse. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it looks like some of the trees are cut down there because they're just the stumps. So maybe, yeah. So maybe so they tried to create a little bit of a clearing. Yeah, exactly. And some uh, some of the other documents that I've seen will talk about how the um, the schoolhouse is so cold because there's no sun that gets into it. So I think sometimes mm -hmm. they would try to cut down some trees because sunlight provided some warmth and meant that they wouldn't have to keep the, the fireplace going all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show one more. Um, this is my last one. And this one is from Langford, which is where I grew up. And I really like this one because there's a few from Langford and Colwood and the um, surrounding area. And they always say that the main industry is poultry raising. But this one I really like too because it says poultry raising and it says that it's a resort. And my grandfather used to tell me how when he was a kid, he would deliver milk and newspapers. And, um, and he had so much more work to do in the summer because all of the people from Victoria, the rich people in Victoria who had summer homes on Langford Lake and Glen Lake and Florence Lake would come out and stay there in the summer and the population would triple. So um, it's funny now to think about people think of Langford as, as simply a suburb, as a little community on the edge of Victoria, but back then it was it seemed much further and it was definitely a place where people had their summer homes. So you can learn a lot about your hometown and what it was like a hundred years ago by reading these documents as well. And I see here that it's 55 kids compared mm -hmm. to other places year. where it was like five. So. Yeah, exactly. So this, this uh, school was definitely a bit busier. And my grandfather went to this school, not at this time, he went in the 30s. So about 10 years after this, uh, but it was still the same building, um, but they had added, I think, some extra rooms on because it was getting kind of crowded. Right. So what I thought we'd do now, maybe I'll leave, I'll leave an example up that has a photo at the top. I thought we would make our own, um, or maybe I should switch it back to me for now. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think so. Okay. You can always come back to that image. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna make up my own. So I've got some blank sheets of paper. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got some uh, paper and some pencils. So you can do this however you want. You can either have two pieces if you wanna draw a picture of your schoolhouse on a separate piece. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to pretend like mine has a little photo stuck on the top like we saw some examples. So I put a little square at the top of my page and that's where I'm going to draw a picture of my schoolhouse. Um, so I'm gonna start by drawing my schoolhouse and I'm gonna think about what my school, so your schoolhouse can be anything you want. You can make it in a person's house if you think that's how people would have gone to school in your imaginary town or the real one that you're thinking about. I'm gonna make mine a little schoolhouse like some of the ones that we saw. And I'm going to put a bell on the top of mine because I think Craig Flower had a bell on it. And I always like to think of uh, the teachers ringing the bell 
to get the kids to come into school. I like how there's that horse in the that one yeah. as well. So I'm going to put a horse in the front of mine. Oh, that's a good idea. And I put a great big double door on the front of mine and one big window on the side. So I'll show you. I just started on mine. I might go back and add some detail later. I'm yeah. just gonna add a, but I put a I put a big bell on the top of mine. We have about five minutes, Genevieve. So. Okay. So, but tight, we're not going to put as much information in our document. You can always add to it later, but what, I thought we'd start with some really simple things. So we're going to start with the name of the school, and we're going to talk about, think about how many kids do you think went to your school, your imaginary school, um, and what kinds of things did the grown-ups do in that area, and also what kinds of things were there to do for fun for the kids. So you can title these things however you want, but I'm going to put the first thing at the top of my document is I'm going to put the name of the school. And I'm going to make up a town and a school name. So lots of times these, this, the name was just the name of the town or the village. My last name is Weber, so I'm going to call it Weberville. Mm. Because that was really common. A lot of these places were named after people. So a settler would arrive and say, well, I'm the first settler to come here. They're probably not the first person there because usually there were indigenous people living there, but they were the first settler to arrive and they would say, I'm just gonna name it after me. So I actually knew um, there was a street in my hometown growing up that was named after a girl I knew because her parents subdivided their property and they just named all the streets after their kids. So sometimes when you see names like that, that's, that might be what happened is somebody just named it after themselves or their kids. So I'm calling it um, Weberville. And then I'm going to put, there was a section on the forms that always said, what's the nearest railway or boat landing or stagecoach terminal? So I'm going to put um, boat landing because mine is um, on an island. So I'm going to say that, um, there's a ferry three kilometers away. So you can choose if you think that maybe, how did people get to your school? Did they get there uh, on a horse and carriage? Did they have to come on a stagecoach? So a stagecoach was like kind of like a bus, but it was pulled by horses usually. Or did they come by boat? Or did they come on a train? So you mm -hmm. want to Think about how people would have got to the community where you lived. So my imaginary community had a little ferry. I remember one of the ones that you showed, it said the train station was in Prince George. That was the yeah. closest one. So yeah, so you it can might put, have been like a, a, long, a long travel from there to the school. Yeah, and if you if you are imagining your, your town uh, close, um, cl kind of close to a big city, you can put that, you can put the name of the big city where people would have had to go. So living conditions and people, the teachers would fill out all kinds of different things under the section living conditions. They would fill out, as we saw, you know, they would say that it's a nice area or it's mountainous, or sometimes they would talk about the fact that there's no running water or electricity. So I'm going to put that it's sunny, but that there is no hot water. Because that's something I think I would miss. I would miss having a hot bath, <laughs> being able to turn on a tap and just have it have it start. Probably not a hot bath at the school, but no, right. <laughs> but in but on the documents they were talking about just the town just in general. Life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it wasn't always focused on on the school specifically. Yeah. Now, one of the most interesting things is um, the number of children at the school. So I'll show you where I'm up to now. So I'm going to think about how many kids went to my school. So I think Weberville was pretty small and it was on an island. So it would have been hard to get to. So I'm going to say that there was 11 kids. And it also said an average age too. So what would be the average right. age of yours? Hmm. Maybe eight. That sounds right. 
that's what I was picturing. <laughs> okay. So I'm now going to put the word industry down. So if you don't know what the word industry means, that means the main type of work that the grown-ups do in the town. So a lot of these uh, forms, they would say logging or fishing or mining. So the grown-ups would, or um, agriculture or farming, so um, that they were farmers. So um, I'm thinking about my town and it's on an island. So I think that probably the main industry for my town is fishing because they lived on an island. So they probably did a lot of fishing. There was some, uh, one of the town, the forms that I didn't show was from a town where they had a cement plant. So everybody in the town worked at the cement plant and the whole town, it only existed because of the cement plant. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of towns like that and uh, in British Columbia as well. They're sometimes called company towns because the company built the whole town just for their workers. Um, but in mine, it's gonna be fishing. And I'm gonna do two more. I'm just, the next one, I'm just putting janitor because I think that's a really interesting question and there is no janitor. Uh, so the kids so have to get, do- Get to work kids. Yeah, so I'm putting kids do the cleaning. <laughs> no, it is a one room schoolhouse, so it's not a lot of cleaning. It's not a lot of cleaning, but <laughs> I would also imagine that some of the things that we use for cleaning today wouldn't exist or wouldn't be as easy to use. Yeah. And also if some of those places don't have water, that seems harder to, um, to get to as well. And I remember, I don't know, Chris, did you ever have to clean chalkboards when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah it's and not easy. No, it, it can take <laughs> a lot of time and, and your arms get tired because yeah. you're reaching up. And so, um, you know, it's it's not a lot of work. Well, this in, a, in our learning center right now, we have a chalkboard. A big oh, chalkboard. yeah. So we do have to clean it. Um, and yeah, it takes, it takes some time. Yeah. I'm, I'm still amazed when I, I had a class come into the archives and I was showing them pictures. They were from Sir James Douglas School and I was showing them pictures of Sir James Douglas and they didn't know what the chalkboards were because they oh. didn't have any in their school. That was the school my kid went to school at. Yeah. And the last, and the one, last one is? Uh, is going to be remarks. So remarks means any other thing you want to write about your school. So this is the place where you get to be really creative and you can think about all the things you want to say. So that was where in those examples we saw people would talk about um, that maybe there was sometimes there was movies, uh, sometimes there was um, there people could go out boating. Uh, so you could talk about what people do for fun. You could talk about what the kids do for fun. Uh, or you could use it to complain about how isolated it is. Um, so this is, this is a place where you can really expand on thinking about your made up school and your made up community and, and what it would be like. Mm. So do you want to just say, just say one, just to close, just what would be your remark about your school? I think my remark would be that, um, that in the summer it's nice for the kids because they get to go swimming in the ocean near the school. Mm. Great. That's the nice part about living on an isolated island. Nice. So um, here at the Royal BC Museum and on, on our grounds we have the St. Anne Schoolhouse, the one room schoolhouse, which usually uh, during the summer you'd be able to go into this summer. Uh, we don't have it open, but hopefully next summer we will. Um, and Melissa, who's one of our um, participants on Zoom, writes about the Museum of Surrey having a heritage camp campus, and they moved the Annie uh, one-room schoolhouse to their property, property recently. Right, I saw it there last time I was there. Yeah. Um, and same thing with St. Anne's Schoolhouse here, they had to move it. It was only a block, but like, it's not easy to move a, <laughs> even just a one-room schoolhouse. So uh, really fascinating to see how that works. Um, so thank you so much. Do you want to one last time just show us what you what you created? So there's the so, picture. It's Weber in the town of Weber Weberville, which is on an island. 
The ferry is three kilometers away. The living conditions are sunny, but no hot water. Number of children, 11, average age of eight. Industry fishing, no janitor, kids do the cleaning, and it's a pretty good place to be. So, yeah, if you I want to make your if you want to make your document look really old and uh, like it's an archival document, you can maybe crinkle it up a little bit and make it look a little worn out, not so shiny new, and then you can pretend like this is your your very own archival document. That uh, you, can. you put it in tea, right? So yeah, to make it look kind of um, yellowed. Yeah. Well, Genevieve, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, it was great, so so great to see all those documents about schools around the around the province a hundred years ago, and think about school and how that's changed from now and the schools mm -hmm. that uh, we have now. So, thanks so much. Well, um, thank you for having me. Yeah. So we'll stop the Facebook Live feed. We'll stop the recording. Now.